welcome, you guys. So um, if you've been to any of my olios before, you know I like to begin kind of getting a sense of who's in the room and what's going on in your imaginations. So when I say the end of the world, I'm going to sorry, I've said it, the end of the world, <laughs> right? So now just kind of do like a mental inventory. What does it look like to you? Like what is the end of the world? And I'm, I'm, I'll actually come back in a second, so I'm going to be silent and let you picture it. Okay, got it? Like the, the end of the world. Um, who wants to tell, like in, in briefly, just what did it look like? Dead. Like dead, what's dead? Everything. Everything's dead? Like plants, animals? Uh, yeah, animals, mostly. Animals. animals like so no humans, no animals. What else? Do you wanna, what, did anyone picture something different? Yeah, please. So wait, I'm, say it one more time. Yeah, yeah, like the kind of post-apocalyptic, like you know, shitty watercolor paintings, like bleh, right. Like, um, what else? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So good. I'm glad you said. Let me keep. What were you gonna say? Oh, like a like a new birth kind of thing. I thought you were going to say your, your academic experience made you think the end was near. And I was like, I get it. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, OK. So cool. So we've got two. I have like right here, I've listed three possible end of the world scenarios that I, would ima that I thought people would come up with. So so far we have, because she said chaotic, if you didn't hear that. So I, and, and that I kind of think like Mad Max, Thunderdome, kind of end of the world, right? Um, the zombies have come back. You know, we're all fighting for the last granola bar. Or just no life left. There's another end of the world, though. Yeah. Yeah, or this, and even like taking it further, or like asteroids, like yeah. yeah like planet. The planet is gone. So that the like our planet world, right? So there's three different levels of world there that could come to an end. We think about the the, the end of the world. So what I want to do though tonight with my space, um, so I'm a 19th century historian, and. What I think is really interesting, if you look at the history of the end of the world, which is, is actually a, it's a field of study. There's a whole journal called Utopian Studies, which is all about futurism, which is usually all about studying like the past of the concepts of the future. And a lot of people thinking about the end of the world coming. What I'm going to suggest to you guys tonight is that all of these possible scenarios, the end of life, the end, what was the other one? Chaotic life, like just kind of, which is actually like the end of civilization. Right, the end of, of law, the end of, of, of states, right? Where it's just like utter anarchy and like rah. Um, or the destruction of the planet. These versions of the end of the world are modern ones. These are, I mean, they, they, they do appear in, in, in like, you know, sort of ancient cosmologies here and there, but this is pretty much a 20th century phenomenon that when people were thinking about the end, they thought in those terms. So um, can, you, can you guys hear me okay? I, I'm, you guys are like this. You need a little louder. Is, I'm not good at this. Is it like that? Ah. Hold on, guys. Like that? Oh wait, here we go. Oh, hello. Better? Oh, okay, cool. Um, okay. So what was I saying? So that's a 20th century phenomenon. What's, so what I'm going to be talking about in my in my time is 19th century concepts of the history of the end of the world. But it's going to look really different than that. And we have to start by thinking about what is the word? Oh, wait. OK, so let's kind of break down the semantics of each of these words up here. So we've already decided kind of what would constitute the end and the world, right? There's another word up here, though, I think that needs, we need to be thinking about the meaning of it, and that's history, right? So the history of the end of the world, or what, is, what constitutes the end of the world. So, what do I mean by this? Um, so, for example, dinosaurs are dead, right? Not very many people. Not many people in the room would describe that as the end of the world. If all human beings died, some of us would say that was the end of the world. Does that make sense? So, the modern concept of the history of the end of the world is usually centered on human activity. Are you with me so far? Okay. So when we think about the word history, this will help us understand what 19th century um, dwellers and, and thinkers, how they thought about the end. And they thought about it a lot. Like, do you guys think that you think about the end of the world a lot? Like, we do. Like, our culture's 
obsessed with it. Like, you know, the zombie shows, like all this stuff, you know. We're obsessed with the end of the world. We have, we, do, we have nothing to 19th century thinkers. And like really smart people were convinced, like, you know, Emerson, through all these people were just like planning for the end on some level. But what they were planning for was a very different end. Something else was going to end besides the end of humanity, the end of civilization. So what was actually going to end is history itself. The end of the world meant the end of history in the 19th century. So what does that mean? We have to think about what we mean in terms of history. So if I tell you that I study, if I, if I studied dinosaurs, would you think of me as a historian? No, even though they're way in the past, right? So history is not simply the study of the past. History is the study of what? What's that? Yeah, it's a study of people, of nation states, of human activity. Um, I was going to do this. Activity plus change. And so if 19th century, if 19th century thinkers were obsessed with the end of the world, and what I'm implying here tonight is they were actually obsessed with the end of history, they don't think they were not concerned that human beings were going to go away. What they were what they had determined was that this was going to end. There would change. There would so it says um, human activity plus change equals history. And if history is going to come to an end, they actually believed human beings would live forever <laughs> by getting rid of change. So this is what I mean by a different concept of the history of the world. And it wasn't like it was like, uh, like, a, like a beautiful, like chilled, like mellowed stasis end of the world. I mean, this is like Christ coming and like getting really fucking pissed and whoever was left would live in a state of non-changing condition forever. What does that sound like? Like heaven? Like when you think about the concept of heaven, do you think about it having time? change over time, like it's, it's eternal light living death, right? It's blissful nothingness, right? Which is kind of like the end. And 19th century Americans were really convinced that the end was near, but it was in some weird way, it was the future that would last forever. And they planned around it with very, really <laughs> interesting ways. I love teaching this. I teach um, some version of this class in my 100 level American history course and it's my favorite class to teach because, well, that's not true. It's one of my favorite classes to teach because, you know, I think we have, as moderns, we have this idea that, like, people, never, people were, like, totally conservative and ne there was no such thing as a freak or a weirdo until the 1960s when people started doing acid and listening to rock music, right? There is nobody weirder than people in the 1830s. <laughs> These people were so fucking weird. <laughs> so I love teaching this it just as a, as a way of kind of disturbing our, our historical imagination, even just to remind ourselves. Um, of how, how odd and, and amazing people have been. And I would even argue that commercial culture and consumer culture makes it less possible to be, to be a total freak without getting co-opted immediately. Okay, so that's our direction tonight. Um, and then I, I think, I don't want to speak for him, but I think Lawrence will be coming in with this more 20th century, like the end, right? Kind of like there's a shift and I'll hopefully get a chance to explain why that shift happens. Um, okay, so to start, I want to give us a bit of a context when we think about these radical utopias. Um, and the end of history. So this, this image didn't turn out as well as I'd liked it to. Um, but what I've got here um, is it was an attempt to, can anyone, anyone want to take a guess what they think this is? Yeah, what's that? I'm not sure. But yeah, it's, it's, um, if you can see, it's really hard to make out, but these are supposed to be different like eras in natural history, and eventually there's civilizations like the Roman Empire, right? And so what's interesting about this, and if this is a concept of history and a concept of time, the most interesting thing about it, obviously, is it's spiral, right? So this is one of the philosophies of history that have emerged over time. I wish I could spend, I mean, if you know, know me, you'd know I could like spend the rest of my life talking about just this one point, because it's my favorite thing in the world, can't, so I'm just going to talk a little bit. Um, but the philosophy of history um, and the historical imagination, to understand what's going on in the 19th century and why these folks 
in massive numbers truly believed at the end of something, whether it's history or, or their lives, was at hand, right? We have to understand what kind of philosophy of history was governing their way of thinking. Um, and the, the reason I think this is so compelling to do is once you learn a little bit about the philosophy of history, and, and there's philosophies of history, you become aware that you are operating under one, usually without any awareness of it. We all believe, we all have kind of a temporal sense of existence, right? Even our, our idea of ourselves as, as, as adults or children, what have you, like since Freud, even Freud was kind of, kind of a philosopher of history in that he argued that the human, the human self had to be understood in terms of stages of development. Sounds like stages of civilization almost, right? He's one of these thinkers of this era. So I love studying history, philosophy of history because it makes us think about like, how do you imagine the past, like, right? Like, do you think there's anything connecting you to the past? Do you? I'm curious. Does your past affect you? Sometimes I, I, I must, it's like the worst thing in the world to admit. As a historian, I'm like, it doesn't. It's just history, like it's, it's dead. I don't know, like I actually really don't know how much I believe in the relationship between past and present. I study the past, but okay, so that would put me in a particular kind of philosophy of history. So just briefly here, um, within the philosophy, so the philosophy of history has two schools of thought. Um, one of them is essentially kind of what traditional historians like myself engage with, uh, what constitutes evidence. How can you prove causality? Does that make sense? Like just like kind of basic, basic methodological questions. The other one is kind of more, you know, kind of French and out there in the thinking, um, or German, I guess. And that would be kind of trying to actually decide, does time move in a line? Is it linear? Is time cyclical? Just, you know, do, do things always repeat themselves? Like the rise and fall of empire. That's a cyclical idea. Empires rot, or become, they start, they rise, they fall. They come, they start again. It's like a, it's a, it's almost like a birth and death metaphor for understanding nation states and empire. That's cyclical thinking. Another, a linear way of thinking would be to say, they start and they like the strongest shall, shall survive forever. Um, what drew me to this kind of thinking actually, and I, I, I give this side note for a very specific reason. I got into under, um, I, I became very fascinated with the philosophy of history. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't put up this. My clicker didn't work. Okay, the philosophy of history, because I study slavery, and what was really striking to me, because I study slaveholders and their ideologies and how they try to make sense of their world. You know, so you guys know the, the dude Hegel? He's like the dude who talked about the philosophy of history. He kind of tried, he coined like the notion that time might, might be both linear and cyclical, and it moves in a spiral. Um, so he was like the giant, he influenced Marx, like he basically influenced anyone who ever wrote anything ever again. <laughs> um, and the first time Hegel, he was writing at the end of the 17th century, early, no, end of the 18th century, the first time Hegel was cited and mentioned publicly, as, according, as far as we know, in the United States was in Mississippi by a slaveholder. He was reading like the hardest shit that's ever been put to paper, <laughs> and he was talking about it in Congress as justification for slavery, because he was arguing that time moved in a spiral. And that really blew my mind, that these slaveholders were not just debating like expansionism, states' rights, they were debating whether or not time was linear or cyclical, and debating which version of time most adequately justified, because either one meant, uh, you know, sla how did it go? If it was spiral, slavery was fine, because all these mistakes are meant to be made over and over again. So they're just the ones that happen to be making that mistake right now. If it was linear, it was fine because we, they were ushering in uh, God's perfect civilization by Christianizing and civilizing darker nations, that they were driving society forward, uh, right? So obviously these guys are a bunch of yahoos, with, you know, we, hate, we hate them, but it was fascinating to me that they're reading this kind of stuff that I'm reading, right, and, and, and moved by. Um, okay, so the debates within uh, philosophy of history are, is time linear or cyclical? Wait, where's my slide? Um, does history have a purpose? That, that's teleological history. Um, do you guys think history has a purpose? Are we here for a reason? Right? <laughs> there's a lot of people who'd like to say that there's no such thing as teleological history, because um, teleological means like the, the, the end was written into the beginning. 
right? Like it was almost, it's like almost Germanic, like, or like the, the germ of thought was there in the beginning. Like the American Revolution led to the end of slavery because people started talking about freedom, which is so fucked up because like the American Revolution tripled the institution of slavery. The end of slavery was because people had a civil war and people fought to end slavery, right? There was no sort of snowball of freedom rolling down some hill that just gathered everybody up. Um, but a lot of people actually think in teleological terms without realizing it. When you say things like it was meant to be or it all led up to this point, right? That's teleological thinking. And without knowing it, you've just admitted you believe in God because there's no such thing as a purpose without some thing that put us here, right? And even if you say, no, it's just survival of the species. Well, why were the species supposed to survive? Like, do you see what I'm saying? Like, there's always a purpose in teleological history. But I think more than anything else, the, the philosophy of history that has governed us um, as Westerners has come from the Enlightenment. Um, I'm just curious. I think I'm doing good on time. Anyone want to take a guess? Like, what, you don't have to have, like, the word, but what kind of, mm, way of thinking most, if, you've, if you know me at all, you've been to any of my old days, you know the word that I hate the most, guides our historical imagination about how history moves, how change happens. Yeah. Oh, you're thinking like the actual person. I'm thinking like, a, like a, just a basic concept. Yeah, yeah. Did you say progress? Yeah, yay, yeah, down with progress, boo, right? So, um, <laughs> Yeah, this, I think, more than anything, has determined how we think about history, that we are progressing. And it, again, it's, you see how there's something teleological about that? If we're progressing, then there's some place that we're supposed to be heading. You know, the end of slavery was a good thing. Freedom is on the horizon. Sexual liberation is coming tomorrow. Do you see this? Like, the, the worst of us is behind us. Does that make sense? Finally, the one last piece of, of historical philosophy that we need to understand, to understand the historical imagination that shaped this end of the world thinking in 19th century, um, for 19th, 19th century Americans, there was another thinker other than Hegel um, and, and other than Marx that strongly influenced, and it, I don't, I shouldn't even speak in those terms, that reflects a shifting, a shift in thought. I love having people guess. So who are the big ones? You got Hegel, you got Marx, somewhere in the middle of that, Darwin. Darwin did so much to change the concept of history. Does that make sense? The idea that the, the evolution, for, that, that human beings have evolved, and I know that I'm, I'm not actually trying to like summarize Darwin's ideas. I'm summarizing how his ideas were ex sort of um, percolated among the population. And very quickly, Darwin's theory of adaptation evolution became what we call social evolutionism. Um, and that is the idea that we are, that society itself is progressing. Um, so the reason I wanted to go through this for a second, this, this quick philosophy of history. So the two, the two uh, theories of, of history that ruled in the 19th century, right? The pr progress narrative and social evolutionism, which you can see they're very easily linked, right? Um, there's something, it, there's an irony about how these philosophies conceive of time that I think helps us understand how people who are obsessed with the end of the world were planning constantly for the, an everlasting future. Do you see the dilemma that I'm trying to work with here? The 19th century, all these folks were like, the end is coming, the end is coming, and we're gonna be alive forever. Somehow these two things coexisted in their mind. It wasn't the zombie apocalypse. It was life forever on earth, or life forever in heaven. And I think if you look at the way evolutionary, evolutionism, and people who invoke this kind of concept of history thought about time and human beings' relationship to it, you can see one of the paradoxes at work here. So let me see if I can do this. It's, this is the first time I've ever like, tried this out in a microphone, this idea, so. <laughs> okay. If you believe that human beings are evolving, or that human society, because that's what social evolution is, that, that society's evolving, that we're becoming more free, more egalitarian, less violent, all these things, right? If you believe that we are evolving towards some sort of greater state than our, quote, barbaric or savage state, does that make sense? Civilization is, is, is a social evolution. Inherently somewhere in there, you believe the future is good, and our, our values now are better than our values of the past. You with me? So the future is where good stuff is. More freedom, less slavery, more women's rights, 
right? More equality. The past is where we were bad and dumb and enslaved people and women didn't, weren't liked. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, that's the dumb people. We're smart. However, if you believe in evolutionary thinking, don't you often draw from nature to try to understand what the right way to behave is? Like women are naturally given toward a certain kind of nurturing, does that make sense? Evolutionary thinking draws from the past to understand our truest nature. To project us into the future when we'll be at our best. It's a paradox. The past and the future somehow tell the truth of us and they're at odds with one another. Are you with me? Does that make sense? And that's what I think kind of helps me understand these 19th century weirdos that I have a deep respect for, by the way. Even though I keep calling them weirdos, like, they were awesome. <laughs> These people were awesome that we're going to look at in here in a second. Um, OK, so what time did I start? When do, how, when do I get to go? OK, cool. Perfect. All right. So just really quickly here, when I talk about the, this utopian movement that emerged, we have to ask ourselves, what was going on in the 19th century? at this particular time, and that, by that I mean like the 1830s, that would lead to these ma this massive movement towards preparing for the end and trying to, not just prepare for the end, these folks are trying to usher it in, right? Trying to usher in the end by moving to utopian communities. So here's what we historians tend to s sort of point to as being the most sort of, the greatest social upheavals that produced this idea that the end is coming. And it, they produced it in kind of a positive and a negative way. The political you know, uh, revolutions, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, what are these other than utopian experiments? The idea that you can completely break with the past, start everything over, and recreate society. However, these massive political institutions that pushed for things like individual democracy, uh, combined with industrial capitalism, produced a society that was incredibly individualistic. Right? Every man, and I say that word on purpose, for himself. And so what you start to see, my last point here, so if you can't see this in the back, it says political revolution combined with industrial capitalism produced massive individualism. And so you start to see this movement, that these, a lot of these reform movements and this idea of transcendentalism emerge. And these, the, the reform movements include things like the women's rights movement, the anti-slavery movement, the abolitionist movement, which are kind of two different things, but, um, and, and this idea of kind of perfecting the soul from within to pr pr produce a, per a perfect society. And the reason we have to understand these things, to understand the utopian impulse, sorry, this is a small writing. So I have the next thing here, it says the utopian impulse. The utopian impulse, these folks that I'm talking about tonight, all these people that moved into utopian communities. And I, I guess I should have asked in the beginning, does anyone, I don't mind, raise your hand and be honest, do you need me to explain what a utopian community is, anyone? We're all good, right? It's just like a, a commune, right? A place where you go and you live very differently than traditional society in an attempt to create a perfect world. Um, if we say that someone is, is attempting a utopia today, are we complimenting them? No, we're usually calling them stupid. And one thing that I think you guys need to understand, to, have the, uh, to, to, to learn history, the most important thing you need is empathy. You cannot study the past if you can't imagine the world from somebody else's perspective who's not like you. And these people are not like us. I am not like a woman from the early 19th century. I cannot assume that we share any values, even the desire for freedom, for equality. I, there's no way I should assume that. So um, what's one thing that's, I think, amazing to consider is that utopia was possible in the 19th century. It was possible. Like, think about it. So many people were embracing it in one way or another, and smart people. Uh, you know, like really learned, educated people. Like I said, Emerson, for example. Um, who's the guy who wrote Hawthorne, for example? These guys joined communes. It meant it was possible. We no longer think it's possible, but imagine a world in which it was, right? So the things that they're trying to, what's amazing, I'm gonna, we're gonna briefly look at three, and I do mean briefly, and then I'll, I'll wrap up here. What's amazing is when we look at these utopian communities, and there were hundreds of them that emerged between 1830 in 1860. Before that, I mean, utopian communities have been part of world history forever. But in the, in the American setting, there's very few of them in the colonial period. You can count, like, perhaps the, you know, the Puritan societies, the pilgrims, as, a, as maybe a utopian society. Um, but in the, right be in the years before, 30 years before the Civil War, 
massive numbers of utopian communities appeared all across the landscape, in the south, in the north. They were very diverse in the, in the kind of makeup they had. They had. All of them had very different rules, but they all shared a few things in common that tell us about not only the concerns of the era, I think they also tell us something about how we imagine the past and the, our place in kind of conducting the future. So each one of these utopian societies, and if you ever come up with one that doesn't fit this mold, tell me, because historians haven't found one yet who study this stuff. Every, and when I say the utopian impulse here, every one of the utopian communities, um, you had to live obviously communally, like you had to work together and live together and make democratic decisions together. They may have had a leader, but every member of the community had a say. They were very, very democratic. So you can see them drawing from the American Revolution tradition in that sense. They all practice socialism. You could not keep your property, right? And they all challenged marriage and women's, uh, the equality of women. And I, I mean, they supported the equality of women in one way or another. Isn't that interesting? They all challenged marriage as a fundamental oppressor for women. So if we think about, so what's going on in the 19th century and why, like, they didn't all get, there wasn't some sort of conference where all the radical utopian leaders got together and they're like, all right, come on, like, what's our basic sketch, people? It just sort of happened. They, they, they don't even have like shared printed culture yet in all these different places. But they all arrive at a similar worldview for ushering in the end. Um, and when I say the ushering in the end, I'll explain what I mean here then. But I'm, I just want to pause here for a thing and think about, does that kind of blow your mind? All of these people in the 19th century, things, first of all, how bad, like, how, raise your hand if you're like, the world sucks. You think the world sucks right now, right? How bad would it have to be for you to leave your home, all of your family, relinquish any, pro any wealth that you had, and if you're married, you had to give up marriage, you had to release any ideas you had about sexual propriety, and join a commune, all right? <laughs> Think about like, how bold and brave these people were, and it also tells us how terrified they were about the changes that they were seeing around them. So what are they seeing? Industrial capitalism is destroying work and destroying the family. Industrial capitalism also really destroyed women's place within the family and within communities. One thing that will debunk your I belief in progress, that, you know, that history is a story of freedom, or sorry, slavery to freedom, is just look at the experience of women between the 18th and the 19th centuries women of all backgrounds. Um, enslaved women, their lives got a lot worse after the revolution with the expansion of slavery. Non-enslaved women, white women, their rights were severely circumscribed after the revolution and their social power within their communities. And people were aware of this and they were trying to confront this in these utopian communities. Um, yeah, and then giving up private property, right? So it, what's interesting is, you know, the, 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 main, um, co the main super socialist one that we'll study, he was a huge influence on, guess who? Karl Marx, okay. <laughs> All right, so let's look briefly then. Anyone have any quick questions? I know we're doing questions at the end, but am I leaving anything? Is there like a big hole that I'm not covering? Yeah. Yeah, how come most of them are in the, um, that's a, yeah, well, part of it is, is relationship with land up here, right, and what was considered kind of unsettled land. A lot of them are actually um, throughout the Midwest, though. They're, I, I think the ones in New York are just much more famous because they had more longevity. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about one tonight from southern Indiana. Yeah. Well, they, they, um, well, there was no sort of presence of a, of a strong state yet, so it wouldn't be communism. So socialism is an economic... Uh, arrangement, yeah, that, and communism is kind of a political program that can in enforce socialism, but it, they don't necessarily go together. But these folks use the term socialism. And from what I understand, that this utopian communities were the first time that word got used in the United States. Um, they, they, they invoked the term, so let's live socially. Okay, so let's learn, okay, 10 minutes, five minutes? I'm good, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna talk. You guys don't really wanna hear from Lauren Student, I'm just kidding, <laughs> I'm kidding, okay. Um, so just really quickly here, let's look at some of these utopias and then I'm going to wrap up by kind of at thinking about why did the history of the end shift from the history of the end of history to the actually the end of the world, right? What happened at the end of the 19th century that turned almost apocalyptic dreams, like the end is coming and we can create it by creating a heaven on earth. 
Do you see what, like, that's what they meant by the end of the world. We will stop changing because we will have essentially died and be in heaven here. <laughs> um, and so they had to perfect society in a way to do that. Have you heard of the Shakers? You guys know these guys? Okay, yeah. I mean, they're kind of my favorites. They're my favorites. Um, so they were, they were started by a woman. She was a factory worker. Um, they were millennial. I can never say this word. Thank you. That restorationist. So this is a belief that you can bring about the, um, that Christ is coming back and you must create the perfect Christ-like society for him to come back to. Does that make sense? Like you are part of ushering in the end of days by becoming more and more Christ-like. So that's how it's an end of world fantasy. Um, and New Harmony, uh, the one we look at later, there was other ones in Indiana where people actually built towns and they would debate like, what kind of buildings would Jesus like? Like they were, it was almost like trying to pitch for like, you know, the Olympics in your town. Like, let's make sure Jesus chooses here when he comes back. <laughs> um, okay, so they promoted radical gender inequality, and um, I should say too, also too, they were anti-slavery, um, and they would, with some of their prophets, they would actually purchase slaves and include them in their community. Um, and when I say gender equality, the way they achieved gender equality was through the, they were celibate. You could not have sex. They believed, so it was started by a woman and she believed any interaction between men and women necessarily produced the degradation of, and subjection of women. There's no way that men and women could come together romantically or sexually without women being oppressed. And think about it, everyone's like, well, how could you live like that forever? Isn't that your first thought? They're not planning to. Jesus is coming back, <laughs> right? They don't have to live forever. They did start to need new members, and so they adopted um, orphans, which there was a lot of those people after capitalism, like industrial capitalism produces a lot of poverty and, and dislocation. Um, and they would all, you know, so they, and people joined them. They, out of all the utopias, they had the highest membership and they weren't reproducing. The, there's like, from what I understand, there's still one left. There's still a community left in Maine. There's two left, yeah, okay. Um, so they did not have sex. If you see here, this building right here, they, pr they promoted really radical gender segregation so men and women, the, every shaker building ha would have two entries for every, like they, you, you had to come and go separately. They were never together, except they did these uh, cute little dances right here where they get kind of close, and that's where they were, that's where they get the name shakers. It's kind of derogatory, but then they embraced it, and it's when they got so taken with the spirit, they, they were like, shake, you know? Okay. <laughs> um, and like all the other ones, they rejected individual property. This is the one that everyone loves to think about, the Oneidas, they're from New York, right? And what do we all know about the Oneidas? I mean, Oneidas? Not just the silverware. They're the freaky sex ones. That's what everyone thinks about. They're so, I don't ever want to call anyone freaky sexually. They are very interesting. <laughs> and so, what's interesting about them in terms of their, what they believed about their place in history, okay, I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna quit. Two minutes? Okay. They thought we had already achieved it. They thought we were at the end of history. They thought we were already perfect. Um, and so because we were already perfect, we could abandon things like monogamy and it actually might take us back to the past. So they practiced one marriage. You, you actually, um, you were policed if you joined the Oneidas by making sure you did not practice monogamy. You had to log your sexual relations into a communal book. They would, um, the, the leader of the society, um, John Humphrey Noyes, he, um, he kind of paired people off and he got to choose whether or not you procreated. Um, so in a sense, what they were practicing was eugenics. <laughs> they chose like the most intellectually driven and decided those were people who got to have the babies. So se it's, it's, not, it's a misnomer to call it a free love society because soci sexuality was very tightly controlled. But you just could not, like if you fell in love with somebody and you tried to in any way claim a relationship with them, you were um, threatened with um, practicing slavery because um, that was an ownership of another person. And then finally, the last one here I'll just briefly mention are the Owenites. So these folks lived in southern Indiana. Robert Owen was, um, he and his son Robert Dale Owen, they ran factories in Scotland. They were really sort of horrified by the conditions of labor there, and they created the first factory village. Um, and so they, it, was, it was secular, but they, they believed that socialism, once we achieved a socialist society, there would be no more class conflict, i.e. there would be no more war. Um, and we would achieve kind of a, like almost a utopian stasis of time. And the way this had to happen was through a like a radical socialist um, endeavor. 
they were the least successful here. They're actually quite successful in Scotland. Americans are not very good at giving up their property. Um, they, they had a much harder time getting a stronghold here. I did want to mention though, another, one of their, um, one of their, where is it? Uh, one of their, oops, sorry. Frances Wright, if you want to learn more about um, another radical utopia, in, she was good friends with the Owens. She created Neshoba community. It lasted much longer. And they got their, their um, they had the same sort of socialist platform, but they got their membership by working and, and creating goods that they could sell in the marketplace, and then they would buy enslaved people and allow those people to join the community. They'd produce more goods, they'd buy more enslaved people. And when they got chased out of Tennessee because she was actually a radical free lover, like woohoo, like real free love, um, she took all of these, uh, the people that would have been sold back into slavery to Haiti. Um, so just like really radical prescriptions for preparing for the end. So. I just want to, I'll wrap up here by kind of talking about the end of the 19th century and what kind of shifts from this apocalyptic fantasy, kind of preparing for the end of history, the end of change, to actually believing the end of the world is upon us. So I just, I had this quote here by Milan Kundera. Um, People are always shouting that they want to create a better future. It's not true. The future is an apathetic void of interest, to, of no interest to anyone. The past is full of life, eager to irritate us, provoke us, and insult us, tempt us, or destroy us to repaint it. The only peop reason people want to be masters of the future is to change the past. And so what I think is amazing when we study these, these radical utopias of the 19th century, they were changing, you know, they're attempting to kind of usher in a state of, of utopian future, like the end of history. But in doing so, they were radically challenging what American identity was at the time and what American history pretended itself to be. By stating a society that abolished marriage, women had full governing rights, and ending slavery, right? This, is not only, this wasn't necessarily about creating a new future. They were attacking the American past in this sense. So what was the change here? Why did we have this huge shift from these fantasies of the end being a good thing to the end being like, I'll just give you a hint, gas masks and World War I. When World War I happened, these same Christian revolutionaries, these same Christian radicals, they abandoned ship quickly and became Christian fundamentalists and started planning for the end of days. So I grew up in a Christian fundamentalist family. I thought we had always been around. It wasn't until I studied history at the academic level, I was like, wait, we're from the 1920s almost? Like, we're that new, and it was like, I mean, it was late 19th century, but it's really an industrial war setting that kind of gave, that kind of stripped from humanity this possibility of fantasizing the end as a wonderful place. And with that, sorry, Lawrence, if I ate in your time. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jamie. That, I, I, we've, we've been so excited to bring these two professors together for such a long time because they're just two of our favorite um, historical thinkers that we have associated with Olio, and it's, it's really exciting to have them both in the same room together. Um, Lawrence only has three minutes to speak now, so he's uh, good, good luck. No, I'm just... Um, but <laughs> Lawrence is... Um, he's been teaching with us for over a year now. I'm, I'm, we're really excited to have him here. He always waits until he comes on stage to grab a beer. It's just right now, his first beer. Um, but I, uh, he's, he's, come, he's one of just the foremost, he's like the scholar on privacy in America. Um, you're, you're gonna be seeing him on the news. Like he's, he's coming out with a book at the end of the year that's um, it's called None of Your Damn Business, A History of Privacy in America. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is actually his first time using a power, PowerPoint with us, and um, I've I've texted with him, and, and I he only he like only communicate he doesn't send texts he only communicates in Rick and Morty gifts, um, which, and so I, I ran through I ran through the whole slideshow and I was like what the what the hell you, you <laughs> there's there's no Rick and Morty gifts in here but I swear you're still you're still in for a treat um, I I'm excited to introduce Lawrence tonight and I'll let him come on up. Happy birthday, Chris. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me in the back. It's mad thumbs, cool. Uh, hang on. Nice. 
That's me. Point at the machine, that makes sense. Awesome. All right. Um, so in case you haven't heard, our nuclear button is much bigger than their nuclear button. Uh, a couple of things before we start. First off, there's no button. Um, we don't use buttons. That would be ridiculous. Um, the probably as ridiculous as this fucking crazy, crazy ass tweet that I saw in real time. Um, the thing that we use to launch a nuclear strike if the president wanted to is called a nuclear football. Anyone ever hear that before? Anyone know what that is? It's not like a football, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, it's, in, it's a nickname that we give for, it's a specific object, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's a very troubling, perfectly succinct, like, yeah, uh, that's exactly what it is. It's a nickname that we get for a briefcase. Uh, the briefcase weighs around 45 pounds. It's carried by a military aide that is never far from the president. Um, because if we ever get the word that someone launched on us, time is of the essence. So the guy usually rides in the same elevator as the president. He's never really that far away. Inside the football is instructions for how the president can assault, like, you know, start our nuclear arsenal. The president also carries the nuclear launch codes with him at all times on a card. Um, anyone know what the card's nickname is? Yeah. The biscuit, exactly. So if the president actually did want to launch our nuclear arsenal, which is actually bigger than anyone else's nuclear arsenal, and it works, um, essentially what he'd do is take his biscuit uh, and then approach the football at which point millions of people would literally die and actually that would be horrific um, as we all kind of smile. Now, I'm a historian in the 20th century um, by training. This isn't the first time in our history that the president has talked to the American public about nuclear war. Every president since Eisenhower really has at some point or another. Now, we're here to talk about the end of the world, so I figured it would be a good idea to use the brief time we have together to talk about the closest humanity ever came to actually being obliterated, uh, which of course took place over 13 days in 1962, which is the Cuban Missile Crisis. When we talk about the button or our nuclear arsenal, mainly what we're talking about is something called an ICBM. Anyone know what an ICBM, anyone know what it stands for? Yeah. Yeah, everybody knows what it stands for. It's a stupid question. Um, it's a, yeah, it's an intercontinental ballistic missile. It's a missile, but it doesn't really work like other missiles. Um, ICBMs were developed in the early 1950s. It was a partnership by the US government um, and the RAND Corporation. We also used a bunch of really good scientists, one in particular, Werner von Braun, who's considered to be the father of rocket science. He had an interesting job in the 1930s. Anyone know what he did? Yeah, he worked for the Germans when the Reich was in charge. Um, but, you know, he was smart, and so it was one of those things where we're like, you were just following orders, right? And he's like, Top, totally. And, you know, so we get, that's actually, no, that's not being fair to Dr. Von Braun. He was actually imprisoned by the Reich in the early 40s um, for speaking out against some of the things that the Nazis were doing, but he was too smart to be killed. Um, so anyway, these guys get together, and there's a misconception that these missiles just go across the ocean. They actually don't. They're a lot more horrific than that. What they do is essentially, let me just, all right, so they don't just like fly over the ocean and land on the thing that we're targeting. What they do is they actually go into space, like rockets, and they go all the way into space, and then the tip of it kind of like pops off, and that's the tip of, you know what it's called? Just the tip, it's called the warhead, right. So the warhead then kind of like, pops off, it has its own guidance system, this goes away, it's like space garbage, and essentially the warhead has thrusters, it kind of sh shuffles all the way around to the, uh, in space, above the atmosphere, to the city it's gonna destroy, and then the thrusters engage, and it spins like a bullet, like a giant asteroid, kind of careening toward whatever the target is, and that asteroid is filled with nuclear material, um, and can set off fission, and then it lands on what the target is. Um, it's absolutely horrific, it's a lot more than just a missile. Um, make no mistake, this thing, this rocket that was invented by our government in the 1950s, this very well may be how we all die. Um, really, after 9-11, uh, 
Americans, we sort of redirected our fear toward terrorism, which is completely understandable. But in our imagination, a lot of times, the nightmare scenario is the non-state actor, right? The terrorist, the guy who drops a biological agent in Times Square, or the guy who you know, conducts a mass shooting or something like that. But this has always been here. The bomb was always there. It never left. It's just something we're thinking about a little bit more now and talking a little bit more now. Um, you and I are hardly the first generation to have to worry about these weapons. Nuclear holocaust, the bomb, <coughs> excuse me. They've loomed very large in the American consciousness for at least half a century. In the 1950s, people processed their fear in a lot of different ways and how to deal with the atomic age. Some people, they built bomb shelters which were very popular, but also kind of fucking awkward, right? Because like, if you hear that the things are going off and your neighbors know you have a bomb shelter, but like they don't have a bomb shelter, that's gonna get strange. There is a kick-ass episode of The Twilight Zone about this. If you have it on Netflix, it's all streaming. Um, that's exactly that situation. Obviously, the bomb wasn't going off and things were super awkward, like after it, when they call kind of come out. Um, in the event of an attack, citizens were instructed if you didn't have a bomb shelter to go to a designated building in your community. Every community had one, so did New York City. Um, and essentially that would serve as a kind of meeting place and a shelter. And we'll never see this symbol before. They're actually still around. You see them in a lot of places. They're just faded because they were put in place in like the 1950s. Um, but essentially, this was a way to designate where to go and what to do. So again, a constant kind of visual reminder, not so much with the shelter, but at least definitely this, the fallout shelter. That, this is what was there. That death was kind of looming. The end of the world was always a possibility. Um, one of the most popular historical remnants and awesome remnants of this period is something called duck and cover. Um, anyone want to hear about this? We make a lot of historical jokes about this. Did you practice duck and cover? Is this, are you in one of these photos right here? Um, for those of you who don't know, fourth desk back, back. No, not head of the class back then? No, exactly. Um, so essentially, Duck and Cover, for those of you who don't know, was this campaign that was put out by the Civil Defense Fund. And what the Civil Defense Fund said people should do was, when you see a flash, because that would be the thing that precedes the tidal wave of nuclear death and destruction, um, you should just put your hands over your head, find some shelter, and kind of duck and cover. Um, obviously, this is ridiculous, but whatever, right? The illusion of safety, it's better than what? Like, your leaders are like, uh, uh, you're all gonna die, right? Like, I mean, no one wants to hear that shit, right, from the guy that you just put into office. So, duck and cover. Um, because this is targeting towards kids, there was actually a mascot. The Federal Civil Defense Fund funds this. This is our tax dollars hard at work. And that's Bert the Turtle. Um, there's a video that I could have included that I didn't have time to, that is this whole song that Bert the Turtle would do. But basically, he was like, hey kids, I got a shell, so I'm gonna be fine. But what you need to do is, if you see the flash, duck and cover. And then like in the background, there's this song that's like duck and, it's super lame, wonderful. Um, really, go YouTube it. There's a bunch of different versions of what they did. Um, all right, let's talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, one of the things that historians think about a lot, especially my generation of scholars, is that how best to approach history from a directional standpoint. Most of the history you studied in high school and most of the stuff that you see on things like the History Channel and for hundreds of years really is what we call top-down history. This idea of study key actors in power, right? You wanna study the Revolutionary War, study Washington, study Adams. Their decisions ripple out, so therefore to study them is to understand history. Of course, this is overwhelmingly the history of rich white men 99.9% .9 of the time in power. Occasionally, their wives would be a little uppity, right? And then we'd write about them. But essentially, this idea of studying that and having things ripple out. Now, in the 1950s and 60s, you see the new social history, this idea that we should reject this canon and that we should start looking at history from the bottom up. Want to know about the revolution? Why did people really fight? You think some illiterate 16-year-old farmer who picked up a musket was there citing Thomas Paine and understood like enlightened reasoning and Republican ideology? Like, absolutely not. When you start looking at the sources and reading his letters and his diaries, it's like, wow, okay, well, you know, this guy was super bored because farming sucks, and it's like the 19, it's the 1770s, and here's an opportunity for advancement. Um, it's your turf, it's your side. So study the labor movement, look at unions, look at the shop steward, look at the organizers, that's how you study it, don't just study Carnegie. You wanna study the civil rights movement. Yeah, Martin Luther King is great, but 
that's a grassroots bottom-up movement, right? Like, learn about the community organizers. Learn about what the hell got a mother of four who worked 12 hours a day off her ass to go march and get attacked by police officers, right? Bottom-up history. Now, ultimately, each has its uses. When you talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis, you have to do it top-down. You can talk about how people reacted to it, but let's be honest about what's happening here. There's 40 to 50 people in two rooms at different sides of the world. You also have Castro and Cuba, and these people are making decisions that ultimately, if they go the wrong way, could lead to complete obliteration. So studying the deeds of these, and they are rich white men, um, is valuable, and we can learn insights. This particular period needs a top-down approach. Um, now, for decades, historians have written that President Kennedy's handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis is masterful a real triumph in the face of uncertain outcomes. And in a lot of ways, this is true. More recently, scholars have started to push back a little, be a little more critical of the president, and we're definitely gonna dig into that as well, but let's go over what happened. So the missile crisis happens in 1962. You could argue it really begins in 1961 with something called the Bay of Pigs invasion. I don't have time to go and tell both stories, but essentially Castro and CIA, I'm sorry, Kennedy and CIA, they try to engineer a revolution in Cuba to overthrow Fidel Castro. It fails miserably. It's a very public embarrassment. The rebels that we had trained were left stranded after we pledged them our support, and then we kind of abandoned them. The whole mess goes public. It's very embarrassing for the Kennedy administration. Kennedy, in one of the better moments of his presidency, doesn't try to deflect, doesn't try to kind of like say that it wasn't him. He goes on TV and totally takes the blame. Buck stops here kind of thing. I fucked up, this was my bad, we deserve better, and then kind of moves forward. But the Bay of Pigs also really increases tensions in the Cold War that were already super tense to begin with. Kennedy's counterpart in Russia, Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev, he wasn't exactly helping to ease tensions either. Khrushchev came up in World War II. He's a tough motherfucker. He was in Stalingrad, which if you don't know is the bloodiest battle in human history. I mean that literally, like literally, literally, more people die at Stalingrad than anywhere and any other point in the history of war for, warfare. Warfare. He doesn't think much of Kennedy. He thinks Kennedy's a rich kid. He thinks his dad is the real brains behind the operation. Um, most scholars believe that the Bay of Pigs implants this profound insecurity in both of them, in Kennedy and in Khrushchev. Both men, after that, start behaving as if their personal manhood was at stake. And after Bay of Pigs, Khrushchev starts getting super confrontational, which is totally understandable, because Bay of Pigs was kind of confrontational from our side into theirs. Never try to forget that the Cold War, whenever you're putting it into a larger perspective, this is about two competing visions of the post-war world. At least that's how it starts. America has an idea of what it's gonna look like. The Soviets have an idea of what it's gonna look like. The Soviets have a very hard go of it in World War II. They're implanted with a profound insecurity. They've been invaded twice, both major wars. While they end up winning, their nation is largely obliterated, so it's understandable where some of this drive is coming from. Um, so Khrushchev, he immediately resumes atmospheric tests of atomic bombs in September 1961. You guys ever hear about this stuff when we used to just kind of test them out and we would explode them in the atmosphere? We wouldn't do it near like cities, um, you know, we do it out in the desert. But the environmental impact is considerable and eventually we stop doing it, thank God. Kennedy hears about the September test and immediately orders his own seven months later just to let people know. The thing about atomic testing is you can't do it in secret. That's not something you can keep off the radar. Like when a giant ass atomic bomb goes off, everyone is aware of it and that's intelligence that starts circling around the globe pretty quickly. Then a flashpoint. Um, in the summer of 1962, the Soviet Union starts arming Cuba with missiles. It had also started increasing its military presence on the island at the end of 1961. These are not defensive weapons. These are medium range offensive missiles. They have a range of about 1,100 miles. They can decimate US population centers, not just Miami, not just Florida. Um, these are designed to give them more muscle and more diplomatic leverage in the Cold War. Something we should be aware of as well, we have missiles that are just as close to them. Anyone know where those are? Yeah, in Turkey. They're Jupiter missiles, and that we have them in Turkey at that point in time. So let's all chill out for a second if we're about to be like, what, those fucking commies were trying, you know, like, ease up. It's, it's escalation dominance. Kissinger writes about this kind of stuff. It did seem to a degree a logical progression to kind of 
you know, create a pin on something that we had in Turkey. Um, fortunately for the US, CIA had grown increasingly suspicious of Russian-Cuban activity around that time, and we started ramping up our surveillance of the island, particularly through U-2 planes. Those are very fast, very high-moving planes that have very excellent state-of-the-art cameras that are able to take aerial reconnaissance in a way that was really state-of-the-art at the time. Now, that September, Kennedy sees the missile silos, he sees that they're under construction and realizes that the Soviets will have launch capability in a very short amount of time. So in September, Kennedy privately goes to Khrushchev and he warns him not to put Soviet missiles on Cuban soil. And Khrushchev's like, what? Like, you crazy JFK? Like, I'm not putting Cuban missiles on Cuba. Like, absolutely not. But on October 15th, photographs from the U-2 reconnaissance planes show definitively that missile sites are well underway in Cuba. We know that the spy planes missed a lot now, but the evidence was compelling. This was nothing short of a major emergency. So what Kennedy does is he quickly establishes a group of advisors. They're called the Executive Committee, otherwise known as XCOM, um, mostly from the National Security Council and some other senior brains to deal with the crisis. And for the next 13 days, high-ranking officials in government Chief among them are people like Bob McNamara. I don't ever see that awesome documentary. If you haven't, just don't even stay for the rest of the talk. Go right now. It's called The Fog of War. Earl Morris did it. It's wonderful. Um, Dean Rusk, Bobby Kennedy, who was the Attorney General at the time, and the National Security Advisor, George Bundy. They dig in. They all get sleeping bags. They all go home sometimes and shower and stuff like that because it's still 13 days. But there's a thing where essentially they dig in and they are going to essentially live at the White House for the next 13 days. These guys are very bright. Um, I say that not as some like rah, rah, rah. I say this as a historian. You look at them, it's a lot of IQ power in the room. They're interesting guys. They understand empathy. They understand the power of global affairs and diplomatic nuances. And they wanted to avoid groupthink, especially the kind of groupthink they think led to the Bay of Pigs a year ago to begin with. So the XCOM members start looking for advice from a wide range of sources, including Cold Warriors, guys like Dean Atkinson, and other military and congressional leaders. They're scared, and they fucking should have been, because work on the missile sites is progressing rapidly, time is short, and this could start the chain of events that leads to the end of the world. On October 20th, Kennedy calls his wife and children back to Washington so that they could join him in an underground shelter if they needed to. Ideas start coming in from all sides. Again, the American people have no idea yet that this is going on. Some people, like Adelaide Stevenson, they want to be conciliatory. They point out, look, we screwed up. We had these missiles in Turkey. This is understandable. We're still paying for the Bay of Pigs. What we should do is demilitarize Cuba. Let's pull all our troops out of Guantanamo Bay, which we've had there since the very early 20th century. Let's make a promise to remove some of those missiles in Turkey in return for the Russians abandoning their project in Cuba entirely. Other advisors got super aggressive. Curtis LeMay, and we'll never hear of him, who if he had his way would have started World War III. Um, I was gonna tell a little story about myself, but now I'm not. Um, I met a family member of his who I studied with um, when I was an undergrad, and when I started studying with him, I guess I am going to tell the story. Um, when I started, when I started studying with him, I'm sitting. He, you know, he was like a thousand years old, very bright and very sharp. And I was sitting there, thinking his cousin was an asshole, like most Americans do, and wasn't quite sure how to bring it up. And then he kind of said, like that mother, and I was like, nice, like we can talk and everything will be fine. So Curtis LeMay is a top Air Force general. He recommends that we straight up invade Cuba. Bomb, send in military troops, hit hard, hit fast, the kind of like Patton, Ulysses S. Grant mentality, really. Get in there, we see the danger. When you see trouble, go straight at it. Lyndon Johnson, he's the vice president at the time, he demands airstrikes against the missile sites. This option seems especially popular with a lot of people as kind of like a middle ground. And if it goes well, we could follow up airstrikes with an American military invasion on the ground. So Kennedy has a lot of options, full blitz, complete conciliatory thing, or he can maybe attack the missile sites with airstrikes, knock everything out, and then if we have to send some troops to clean up, we clean up. Now, Kennedy doesn't like the idea of conciliation. He thinks that this is gonna brand the US as soft and that it's gonna brand him as soft. 
A lot of this has to do with the legacy of World War II. This idea in the 60s that, look, what we should have done was stop Hitler at Munich, right? That that would have been the thing that prevented all of the catastrophic events that happened afterwards. This idea of appeasement, that that's what weak people do, that's what gets people killed, looms very large in the American consciousness in 1962. We've yet to learn the lessons of Vietnam. We've yet to learn, you know, the long, prolonged, protracted existence of what it is to invade a country. We believed very much in our military might, so Kennedy's not going to back off. But at the same time, he's not going to back down from what he considers to be Khrushchev's reckless behavior. As far as he's concerned, the missiles have to go, but he doesn't like the idea of airstrikes. He doesn't want for a couple of reasons. One, there's no guarantee we're going to get all of them. So if we send in airstrikes, we attack the missile silos, if we miss a few, a couple of things could happen. The Russians see it as an attack and they retaliate, probably in Berlin. If not, then what they would do is maybe retaliate with the missiles they have and start World War III. The other thing is Kenny doesn't want a first strike on his conscience. He understands that this is something that might spiral out into World War III, and he doesn't want to be the guy that fired the first shot. Finding a way to kind of back things off, he doesn't like that option as well. If he can, one of the great brilliance of Abraham Lincoln was that you know he got the South to fire the first shot at Fort Sumter. It gives you a certain moral high ground in the history books. Um, so the United States is going to have to retaliate, but he doesn't really know what to do. Kennedy's in a tight spot. So he settles on a middle ground. Anyone know what the middle ground is? Yeah, a blockade. What we do is essentially the United States Navy is going to be deployed to Cuba. The fleet is going to surround the island with a blockade. You guys know what a blockade is? You basically strangle an enemy. You surround a place. It works really well on islands. It also works really well when your navy is as kick-ass as the United States Navy. So there's a thing where we surround the island, and no ships are going to come in or out without being boarded. We would let it known that if Soviet ships tried to run the blockade, we will blow them out of the water. So on October 22nd, that's the plan. A week after the evidence came into the White House, Kennedy sends a cable to Russia, and then he tells Khrushchev about the blockade privately. After he tells Khrushchev about the blockade, he goes on TV and tells the American people the same thing. This is what makes Americans aware that the crisis is going on. This is what prepares Americans for the fact that there's an end of the world. Almost every American tunes into the broadcast. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. The purpose of these bases can be none other than to provide a nuclear strike capability against the Western Hemisphere. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will they found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. I call upon Chairman Khrushchev to halt and eliminate this clandestine, reckless, and provocative threat to world peace and to stable relations between our two nations. I call upon him further to abandon this course of world domination and to join in an historic effort to end the perilous arms race and to transform the history of man. Our goal is not the victory of might, but the vindication of right. Not peace at the expense of freedom, but both peace and freedom here in this hemisphere, and we hope around the world. God willing, that goal will be achieved. So Kennedy takes a stand. Fear and tension spread all over the world. Churches are flooded, synagogues, mosques. Billy Graham, anyone ever hear of him? One of the most famous ministers of his generation, um, really of the 20th century. He's in Argentina at the time and immediately starts giving a series of lectures on the end of the world. Is your soul clean? Is there, are you ready to prepare to meet your maker? Um, things move very quickly. Soviet submarines are spotted in Caribbean waters. 
Photos show that Soviet freighters are approaching the island, and the calculations say that they'll be in Cuba by the following morning. The public is made aware of this. The range of potential counter moves by Khrushchev is almost too horrible to think about. You can think about all the different ways he can respond. They go on until infinity. The president, like millions of other people, he waits nervously to see what would happen the next morning when the Soviet ships would have to decide what to do. Suspense is palpable, it seems unbearable, and then relief. At the last moment, Soviet freighters turn around. Other ships that weren't carrying munitions stop. They agree to be boarded by the American Navy. They are boarded, they're inspected, they're not carrying weapons, and they're allowed to proceed. The famous quote from Dean Rusk is, we were eyeball to eyeball, and the other fellow just blinked. But the crisis wasn't over, and a lot of people, it's important to understand that. Constructions on the sites were already underway in Cuba, and there are already missiles in Cuba. Very soon, those missiles might be operational. The missiles have to go. So Kennedy insists that the missiles be removed and the sites inspected. He has momentum on his side. Khrushchev was just kind of publicly humiliated. He seems to be suing for peace. So on October 26, Khrushchev agrees. He sends a letter to the White House, and he says he will remove the missiles if the US does a couple of things. First off, end the blockade. Two, I need a solemn vow that you won't ever invade the island, that Cuba will remain Cuba, that there will be no military presence there outside of Guantanamo. So everyone's like high-fiving all around, considering the offer. It looks like everything was missed. And then things get really fucked up. A second cable comes in from the Soviets, and it adds a new demand. They're like, oh, and also what we're going to need you to do is remove those Jupiter missiles that you have in Turkey. And we're going to need you to do that publicly. Then as we're flying more reconnaissance missiles um, missions over the island, a Soviet officer who's in charge of anti-aircraft fire shoots down an American U-2 and kills the pilot. The pilot was one of the original pilots who got the reconnaissance photos to begin with. This is an international incident. We know now, because the wall came down and Americans have access to public archives in the Soviet Union, that Khrushchev never ordered the missile strike. This was something that was done by a field commander it was a split decision. They saw the plane, they saw the target, they had a lock, and they shot down the American plane. This could have started World War III. The Joint Chiefs are furious. They're foaming at the mouth. LeMay and everyone else calls for an immediate strike, take the deal off the table, let's invade Cuba. They drew first blood. Kennedy, to his credit, holds off. and says, give them another day. Let's see what's going on. At this point, Bobby Kennedy and a number of other Advisors, they offer a way out of this impasse. They said what they should do is write the Russians a note. We totally can't get rid of the Jupiter missiles now, at least not publicly. They shot down one of our planes. Write the Russians a note and say, we'll accept your deal that you promised in the first note and just act like we never got the second one. Seems juvenile, like something my like teenage kid sister would do. But in the end, send the note being like, hey man, totally psyched about this piece. We are absolutely going to end this blockade, and we are absolutely going to you know, never invade Cuba. So if you could just get those missiles out, that'll be great. And we don't even mention anything about the Jupiter missiles in Turkey. We just act like we never got it. Kennedy's like, sure, whatever. And we go for it. And I'm sure it was much more dignified. Um, but he also goes on TV again and explains the deal, never mentioning the second note. But what he doesn't tell the American people, which we know now, is that while we're making this deal, he sent his brother, Bobby Kennedy, to the Russian embassy in Washington, DC, who at the time were too, anyone know what they were doing in the Russian embassy at this point? We weren't gonna kill them. It's not like they were preparing for us to like invade them, like Iran or something like that, with the embassy situations. Um, does anyone know what they were doing? Burning documents, yes, very good. Um, the smoke supposedly could be seen coming out from like the chimneys in the Russian embassy. They were burning every classified document because they figured immediately they would be at least detained and arrested and then sent back to the Soviet Union. So Bobby Kennedy is sent to the Soviet embassy. He speaks to the ambassador and he basically says that if the Soviets play along with this thing that we missed the second note, we will get rid of the Jupiter missiles within the next 18 months. We were cool with this anyway. They were obsolete strategically. They didn't weaken us from a nuclear posture. We would have been OK. Um, we also agreed to get rid of some in Italy. So Khrushchev can go back to his generals, looking like he actually got something out of the deal. But publicly, this wouldn't be revealed. Khrushchev, who was so pissed off that one of his commanders had shot down a U-2 and basically almost started World War III, was very excited to get an opportunity to just walk away from all of this. And that's what they gave him. 
He accepts the deal. Kennedy is delighted. He later says privately, I cut his balls off. Um, you know who's super duper duper pissed at how this all plays out? Not just Curtis LeMay, but the guy I'm not really talking about at all. Yeah, Castro. Castro's furious um, for a couple of reasons. One, he wasn't involved at all in the process. He hears about it on television, just like everyone else does. So, you know, the uh, Russians are supposed to be his allies, right? So the fact that a guy with his ego isn't included in the process is pretty severe. Um, supposedly, he kicks a wall, smashes a mirror, and he says that Khrushchev was an hijo de puta. Anyone know what that is? Like, you're a son of a bitch, and that he had no cojones, which is balls. So everyone's obsessing on Khrushchev's balls. Um, that's the story. That's the story of the closest the world ever comes to complete annihilation. There's a steady rollback from there. There's a couple of things I want to go over from a historian's perspective. A lot of scholars give Kennedy high marks for his handling of the missile crisis. They praise his flexible response. Other admirers say he was very cool and collected throughout the process. They especially praise his ability not to cave into the pressure of people like LeMay. Kennedy's young, he's not a kid, but you know he's in his early 40s. His military experience was kind of a little scarce. And look, I know it's nice for all of us to be like, I totally would have like been steadfast and held the ship. Look, it's one thing to read about these things in books and like watch videos and come to the Strand and like, dude, I'm having a blast, this is great. And you're all very nice and attractive people. But there's a thing where when you're steering the ship, that's indifferent. When the history is remembering you, that's different. You're responsible for the lives of hundreds of millions of people, your countrymen, the people who elected you. Despite what we see on movies and TVs and things like that, a lot of times being very aggressive out the gate in a confrontational situation is absolutely the way to go. You see the rabid dog, you put it down fast. So him getting that advice from career generals, guys who came up in World War II, to shrug that off is, is really no small thing. To have the patience, the foresight to kind of dig in, see what was going on, not in a cowardly way, he wasn't conciliatory, is something that's really important. But in recent years, Cold War scholars have also been more critical of Kennedy, to their credit. I'm not here to shit on JFK, but there are some things that are worth questioning. First off, why does he go on television and call out Khrushchev like that? It's something worth thinking about. He was understandably pissed that Khrushchev lies about the missiles, and he's understandably eager to get this kind of diplomatic victory that could humiliate Khrushchev in the process. But it's one thing to push against someone in private. It's another to do it on TV. Do you know what I mean when I say that as soon as he went on TV, there are less options available? Because it's one thing to communicate back and forth, Khrushchev wants to get out of this deal. But now that the world knows what's going on, if you back off, you're gonna look like, you know, I'm not sure, like, you're gonna look like a punk, right? Like to a degree, you have hardliners, your people, the military commanders, it's not the easiest thing to be the premier of the Soviet Union. There's numerous factions, things going on. To appear weak in that thing is something that's very, very, very dangerous. Kennedy knows that. Um, he could have privately reached out made the same deal, made the same offer, advised that maybe he was gonna move the missiles out of Turkey and not put this in the public view. So the fact that he does go on TV and let the people know, and he's a very charismatic guy and that's a super interesting speech, but at the same time, it does take options off the table. And we shouldn't ignore that. We should understand that in the quest to kind of publicly humiliate Khrushchev or at least raise the stakes, that's troubling. We read Kennedy's memoirs, and he later said that if Khrushchev, quote, wants to rub my nose in the dirt, it's all over. That essentially, if Khrushchev just stepped on the gas after that speech, we really could have descended to World War III and into maybe the end of the world. So something to think about. Another thing we know now that we found out in the 90s um, at a conference in the Soviet Union when we were being all friends again and kind of talking about history. It's a very exciting time if you studied Soviet history and you were a US historian. I was like 11. Um, but there's a thing that we realized how much we actually missed. Nobody knew that we had about, that the Soviets had about 42,000 soldiers on the island that we didn't catch. So if we were going to invade, there's an entire military presence that we just weren't aware of. If we pulled the trigger on that option, it could have gone very wrong. Also, America has what's called exhaustive security protocols when it comes to using nuclear weapons. The president is the only one that authorizes the nuclear strike. The captain of a nuclear submarine can as well when he has authorization. But otherwise, that's pretty much it. Not every nuclear power does that. India and Pakistan, for example, in a ground war, they give thermonuclear authorization to their field commanders. Colonels and generals are allowed to launch those strikes if they deem them as relevant. Not ICBMs, but still short-range missiles to win. 
the Russians had in Cuba. We didn't know this, but now we do. So if an American invasion force, let's say like the 2nd Marine Division out of Camp Lejeune decides that they're gonna come in and kick ass and go into Cuba and really start invading to get those missile sites, what could have happened is they could have dropped many atomic bombs on them and actually like destroyed sections of Cuba and that absolutely would have started World War III. If you see tens of thousands of casualties coming off in a big strike like that. So the fact that we missed that, is important because it meant that we were entertaining an option that really would have blindsided us. The punch that knocks you out a lot of times is the one that you don't see coming. My point is, we're lucky and we're smart. Sometimes it's better to be lucky than it is to be smart. Um, the Cold War is never going to get as hot as that ever again. Um, it is, again, the closest humanity ever comes to this kind of obliteration. Um, remarking on it later, Kennedy has this great quote. Um, he says, in the final analysis for our common link is that we all inhabit this small planet, we all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and of course, we're all mortal. All right, that's it, I'm done. Thank you so much for coming.